Good afternoon, everyone. It is Friday, uh, let's see, February 4th, and our afternoon session is going to be uh, on H628, an act relating to amending a birth certificate to reflect gender identity. And this afternoon, we're going to be hearing from a number of individuals to testify in this. And we welcome you all. And uh, members, there uh, are some documents that you'll find on the committee webpage. And uh, we were going to start off with Mr. Englander from the health department, um, but he is not here right now. Um, so we are going to um, turn it over to uh, Ms. Churchill. And if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself for the record, and then um, the floor is all yours, or the screen as screen is. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite used to testifying um, through Zoom, but I'll do the best I can here. Um, for the record, my name is Brenda Churchill, and I am the State House Liaison for the LGBTQI Alliance of Vermont. And I'm here today to testify on H628, a bill that has finally made it to the State House after two years of work of many people. I'll first speak to my involvement since 2020. The genesis of the spill was an inquiry from a person in Oregon who was having, uh, and this is a recap of, of Representative Taylor's detail from Wednesday. Um, They're having trouble getting their Oregon driver's license because Oregon needed a uh, certificate from the home state, a birth certificate that indicated um, their gender to be other than M or F. And since we live in a state uh, that only has M or F on birth certificates, uh, they were unable to obtain their driver's license, even though they spent many hours uh, contacting Vermont Department of Health um, and representatives and uh, very frustrated, finally uh, worked through the Pride Center and the Pride Center referred it to me. Um, his, the pain of that individual was, was palpable and the work that they were doing was, was yeoman's work and to try to do it from Oregon was, was really pretty remarkable. Uh, you know, I, I worked on adding a third gender to Vermont driver's licenses and official IDs. And literally, I think we put the cart before the horse on this. I knew at that moment uh, that I con this individual contacted me that we needed to change uh, that process to correctly allow Vermonters of all genders to amend their birth certificates. And this can be done right now legally in other states, 12 other states, including the District of Columbia. Uh, as efforts gained traction to facilitate the addition of a third gender to our birth records, we had folks uh, in all levels of uh, state government urge us to continue. We had a white paper that was a re research that let us understand that we could achieve this through rulemaking. And there was precedent for doing that both in Vermont and other states. We finally were able to gain a meeting with David Englander that with Representative Taylor's help, we determined that we indeed needed uh, that to happen, but it would create an inequity um, among folks who identify as transgender and non-binary. Uh, current law to change your sex designation on Vermont birth certificates. I'm going to add a disclaimer here. Uh, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not studying to be a lawyer. Um, I do want to say that uh, there's a cost here that has to be considered with regard to doing this work. Uh, there are fees to the courts to make document changes. Uh, their fees to uh, doctors and perhaps even a lawyer, like I did for my name change. Um, the competent and degreed psychologist must also certify that the individual has been meeting the requirements to live authentically. Uh, I actually got a note from my general practitioner and a certified psychologist in order just to change my name. Once that's done, you are allowed to make these changes. The inequity part, as explained by Mr. Englander, uh, comes from allowing a non binary person to just ask to do it without the gatekeeping that male to female or female to male transgender folks are required now to do by law. Uh, you know, this, this does have time and an expense. Uh, and besides the obvious inequity in this, there's also a discriminatory, a discriminatory part that is often overlooked. Many folks do not possess the means and money to be their authentic self and continue. And as a result, they continue to leave, live a closeted life being economically disadvantaged and part of a marginalized community often leads to depression and if not resolved, uh, people do commit suicide. We discriminate in a way that harms our marginalized communities 
that cannot achieve their authentic selves. Listening to the questions from representatives in the room on Wednesday, I realized that this bill would be critical to lowering the legislatively imposed barriers that were put in place by well-intentioned legislators not that long ago. These barriers placed a burden on transgender folks that if insurmountable could lead to their harm or kill themselves. These statistics are real and reflected in surveys and the toll on human life. For me, being able to live authentically and be able to move the needle in many ways to prevent unnecessary hurt or loss, this will make Vermont a much safer and better place to live and work for everybody, but especially my community. Um, I've looked at the amendments that Mr. Englander has offered and I'm in favor of them. Uh, and I would ask you to vote to allow this to go the entire assembly to become law and create equity for Vermonters who wish to become who they want to be and become their authentic selves. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if, if there are any. Thank you, Ms. Churchill, appreciate that. Um, and uh, I, you were very um, concise and uh, well-planned and I'm just wondering if you have written um, your testimony, if you have, that would be wonderful if you might submit that to Julie Tucker, our committee assistant. I, I do and I will. Thank you very much. So um, members, are there any questions? Represent Rosenquist. I just wanted to make sure I understood. Are we talking about the bill before us or the amendment that apparently I haven't seen yet, right? Yeah, uh, there are amendments on the webpage, on our committee webpage that uh, Mr. Englander, who uh, is not here yet, but he will speak to them. Uh, what I just heard Ms. Churchill say was that she was in favor of those Amendments. amendments. Okay. Yes. That's what I to make sure. Yeah. The amendment was just added to our committee page. Um, okay. It's on our committee page. Reasons. Yes. Thank you. Um, Representative Small. Yes. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. And thank you so much, Ms. Churchill, for your testimony today. Um, I just had a question about the impact of your work previously on driver's license and uh, extending and having a gender X marker available and knowing the impact that it has had on community so far, and if you also have information on how many folks have been able to utilize that resource. Thank you, uh, Representative Small, um, who I continue to work closely with on many different issues and articles. And I just wanted to shout out to James for uh, being part of this committee and um, thankful that he's he and I have a great dialogue as well. Um, on the driver's licenses, we started an effort to add that third gender um, to be able to allow people to be identified uh, legally and properly uh, and also to their uh, their own needs to, to have that legal documentation. Um, we now have currently over uh, almost 1,300 people according to the Vermont uh, Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, this has been more successful than I ever imagined and we've never advertised that that is available. Uh, to Vermonters. So by word of mouth, uh, people have uh, opted for that designation. And I am deeply appreciative of the work that we did with uh, uh, former former Commissioner Robert Ide and current Commissioner Wanda Minoli. Um, we have been able to do that successfully. We got consensus from um, law enforcement through the Law Enforcement Advisory Board. And we also gained consensus through the community uh, by talking to all of or at least as many of the LGBTQ uh, organizations that are, are in Vermont. Um, and we were able to achieve that through rulemaking, uh, which is indeed what we thought we could do with this bill here. But again, with Mr. Englander's input and, and work that he did, uh, we noted the inequity. So we actually have to repeal a statute before we move forward uh, with uh, rulemaking and the inevitability of being able to choose um, a gender marker that most closely fits the individual. Great question, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Churchill, um, you just sort of opened up a question for me in thinking about this. Um, uh, and I'm just curious to know if there have been any efforts to try to do this in a more universal fashion, you know, so we, so honestly, so we don't have to go piece by piece to different applications and different, um, other legal documents and things like that. You know, we, we see gender listed on, you know, many documents. And I, I um, have become aware of this, you know, more recently. And I'm just wondering is, 
uh, I'm not talking about necessarily having to do it with this bill, but I'm just wondering if you are aware of any efforts to try to do this on a more universal fashion um, with Vermont records and applications and the like. Yeah, uh, I don't think, and thank you very much for the question. Um, and I'm glad you're thinking along the same lines that many people are. I do not think that could be achieved in one single bill when you look at all the documents that just the state of Vermont needs uh, to have gendered. And you got to ask yourself the question, why are they gendered? Why is there a designation for male or female on a fishing license? Uh, what does that mean and who uses that data and uh, why is that data there? So from an, from an objective standpoint, sometimes we have to do these things in steps uh, because to do them all at once would be extremely cumbersome. Uh, but now with this, we probably could move through and just um, identify and work on documents by departments. And what do they need gender on them for? Why do they have to be that way? I can see how insurance companies might want that when they're using their actuary tables and determining rates of, of mortality. But I'm really not sure that uh, um, we need to do that in all corners of of uh, documents and or documenting. So that's a great question. No, there has not been an effort to to do this all in one fell swoop, but it has led us down a path of very thoughtful uh, deliberation and discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, it, and it, it, would, it would seem that um, honestly by an administrative order that there could, uh, that there's something along the lines of administrative order requiring all departments to review their you know, applications and things like that. Um, so, all right, thank you. Thank you for answering the question. Um, I feel like there's more work to do, obviously. Um, and I see we're joined by Mr. Englander, but I wanna, before I, I turn back to him, I want to check and see if there are other questions um, from committee members. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, Ms. Churchill. Appreciate it and appreciate you sending in your testimony as well. Thank you for allowing me. Um, you're welcome and you're always welcome to be here. <laughs> um, Mr. Englander, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, we, we would love to hear your comments. <laughs> I've gotten so good at reading lips. <laughs> yes, we, uh, one of our members just said we, we're so good at reading lips now. <laughs> well, good afternoon, Matt, uh, Madam Vice Chair and, and the committee. I apologize for being, uh, for being late. I was having some IT issues. I'm not used to being in, in the home office. Um, so as you've, are, well, let me actually start um, with what you what actually with what you just raised, which is that act, the the um, with regard to uh, gender being required for all sorts of, of forms documentations throughout state government, this is actually an issue that I've spoken out both with uh, Representative Small as well with Representative Mulvaney Stanek. That this is a conversation that has begun. Um, we started talking to DFR and Diva and our other partners to say we do need to have this comprehensive look at exactly uh, what, what was just said, which is we're collecting this information, why? Is, is it useful? Is it, is it ultimately harmful? Um, thank, you. Uh, thank you for um, mentioning that, Mr. Englander, and thank you for taking some leadership with regard to engaging other departments across state government in doing the same. Absolutely. I, I had um, planned, I'm sorry. Mentioned one thing. I just wanted you to know that um, committee members do have your proposed amendments, but we have not reviewed them. Um, so uh, I'm not sure um, the, anything else that you're gonna talk about, but I just wanted to make sure that you do review those with us. Terrific, I, I certainly will. Um, my original intention was to have quite a, a long speech about the critical importance of this, but maybe since we've already jumped into questions, I'll, I'll abridge that somewhat. I do want to say that, um, first of all, I'm delighted to be to spend two consecutive Fridays with the, the House Human Services, but um, the department is, is giddy uh, to bring this proposal before you. This is uh, something that, we, that the department feels very passionately about. We've been working on it uh, for some number of years. There was something happened you may have seen in the news that disrupted some of our normal uh, uh, work throughout the, the past weeks and, and, and years. Um, but this is a, an absolutely critical issue. Um, and it, is, it is rare that there is a nexus between government bureaucracy and opportunity for equality and justice. And, and, and we view this proposal very much in, in that light. 
Uh, it's useful to know that the Department of Health switched to gender neutral nomenclature on for parents uh, 10 years ago, approximately 10 years ago, we believe it was 2012. So birth certificates used to say mother and father, and we switched to parent and parent, and we worked, we worked with hospitals and providers across the, the state to, to do that, um, to, to reflect, you know, Vermonters' needs. And so the department views this as, as simply an evolution of that. Um, I, if, I, if you'll allow me, I, I do want to take a moment just to say that there is a sense in the in the in the broader narrative about this discussion that this is that this is not that this is novel. This idea of third gender uh, or a non-gendered person is novel, and in fact, non non-gendered persons, trans persons, uh, persons that don't that are um, that not associated with 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 the with this binary description have existed since the the rise of civilization, and that that the strict categorization of male or female. Is, is analogous to the, the 19th century race laws, which were created for the purposes of institutionalizing racism and bigotry to include and exclude people. So I just, I would just, it, it's, it's important to view this sort of in, you know, in, the, in the broader spectrum of history um, and how this is consistent with um, uh, a, a practice that leads us to um, a, a place where government is reflecting the, the needs of, of its people and uh, and looking to, to reduce harms in, in whatever way we, we can and support obviously um, you know equity and, and transparency. So with that, how how would you like to me to proceed? Would you like you you right? I think Tucker Tucker's already walked through the, through the proposal itself and its intentions. Um, would you like to ask questions or should I walk through the amendments? What, what would you like me to do next? Yes, and Mr. Englander, I, I think that what I'm hearing from committee members is that they would like you to walk through the amendments. And uh, again, committee members, you can find them on the committee's webpage. So these, are, these two amendments are offered by the department in response to questions raised uh, by, by the committee on Wednesday, but also in conversations with stakeholders over the past few days. I do wanna note, um, the department is working with stakeholders for um, almost a year at this point on this proposal. Um, but 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 as we as we have maturation in our thoughts, we you know we, we come up with new ideas. So I do apologize to the committee for coming for coming to the, uh, the the committee somewhat late with these two offerings. So the first and this so I have it up in front of me. The first has to do with making it extraordinarily clear that it is the intention of both the legislature and the department that a third gender be included in a birth certificate. Um, and I think the simplest way to do that, left up to your collective wisdom, if I can find the language and you'll forgive me, um, And I'm, I'm trying to very, very quickly reaccustom myself to the to the home office. And by home office, of course, I mean. Would you like some help? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Representative McFarland, there is no one in the world I'd rather accept help from than you. <laughs> would, you would you like me to have uh, Julie put it up on the screen? Sure, sure. I also I did I did manage to find it after only about twenty minutes or so. So well, I'm just. I am just uh, curious also, uh, our committee assistant has pointed out that perhaps uh, maybe not everybody who is on the Zoom call can access it. So why don't we go ahead and uh, put it up on the screen, um, Julie, if you wanna do that or if you wanna make Mr. Englander co-host either way. Yes. While we're doing that, uh, this is a subject that a lot of us don't talk about very much, quite frankly. So, or at least, yeah. Uh, so, and there's some wording and definitions which I'm totally unaware of. I mean, that I, I think I know what some of these things mean when we talk about binary, non-binary, non, non-gender, non uh, gender neutral, and then the use of multiple pronouns uh, that are, what do you call it? Uh, Plural, okay, they, them. I don't really know what that means. So is there somebody in this group that can explain some of that? Okay, so <laughs> so we can get a better feel for 
what we're trying to do here. Absolutely. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, may I? Absolutely, Wonderful. Representative Small. Um, so when we're talking, I think we'll, we'll start with non-binary. So understanding that when we are taught about gender, we're taught about two options per se. So man and woman. And non-binary is saying that it is someone who does not identify with either of those identities. It, it is outside of it. Dare I uh, feel like David Englander in this moment, uh, comparing it to <laughs> politics in a, in a sense, um, how we're taught about the two party system and how we have a plethora of third parties available. Um, so non-binary would be that plethora of third parties that are out there um, outside of that two party system. And then when we're talking about pronouns, as you identified very well, it is um, the most common ones that are, are used are he, him, his, and she, her, hers, and then they, them, theirs, though there are additional pronouns that people may use for themselves. Um, and what, what's the plural one mean? That's a what point. Oh, great question. So uh, they, them is a, a non-gendered uh, pronoun. So it doesn't um, make an assumption about gender when you're using it and can be used in a singular sense and in a, a plural sense as well. Okay. Now, when you said uh, there's a term that David used a minute ago, it said non gender or something. I'm trying to think about that wasn't quite it. But, uh, um, gender neutral. Mm -hmm. Gender Gen neutral. Gender maybe? neutral, I guess. Yes. Okay. Yeah, gender neutral. Sometimes people use gender neutral or gender inclusive. Uh, language is just uh, not using specific uh, gender language. So sometimes we think about that in relationship to others. So how we would say that we have a mother and father, but we can also use a gender inclusive or gender neutral term such as parent or guardian. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you um, for asking the question, Representative Rosenquist, and thank you, Representative Small, for, um, for the response. Uh, Mr. Englander, please uh, go ahead. We can see the um, can see the amendments up here on the screen. So the, the first one would simply be to add the, the phrase at the end of the, the findings that says include including but not limited to a third non guardian mark marker. So what that what that means is that the the, the legislature is requiring. Uh, is imposing a non-discretionary obligation to provide a third gender. So right now we have M and F, we would add a third, that might be X, it might be something else um, uh, following discussions with stakeholders during the rulemaking process. But this provides absolute clarity that it is, it is our collective intent that there be at least a third non-binary non marker. And the reason it's in the findings is just because it, you know, we, we always try to minimize what's in the, the green books themselves. So th this is a clear and unambiguous directive uh, that, that, that myself and future Department of Health employees will have to abide by. It's also a clear directive to LCAR, to the Legislative Committee Administrative Rules, that this is what is intended by the legislation. Anybody have any questions regarding that? Committee members, oh, I, I can't. I can't see. Uh, the process. So, okay. <laughs> okay, that's all right. We'll, we'll have committee discussion too, okay. uh, mm -hmm. Representative Rosenquist, about it. Uh, Representative McFawn, I can't see you now. So, uh, if you have something, just speak up. Shall do. Okay. Thank you. Do you have uh, Representative Gregoire? Kind of, but I don't know if this is the place. Um, I would just ask. Had there been any discussion, uh, and, and for, good, for better or worse, of not having uh, you know, gender, male, female, non-binary, but having um, the uh, XY and XX designation? And if so, if so, what, I mean, was it even talked about or would it make sense? And since it's an identifier, I'm just curious. It, 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 it's, a, it's a great question. It's something you hear asked, uh, talked about quite a bit. So I'm just curious if it came up. Yeah, it, 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 we had an internal discussion about this, about this very thing. Um, I think that that is, that may be the future. As of today, if somebody doesn't have, if, if, if we adopt a novel, um, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but if today we adopted novel gender markers, it, it, that the, the person choosing those would, it would um, encounter a whole host of issues 
uh, interacting with the federal government, whether it be to, you know, to getting a passport or getting a uh, certain kind of federal licenses. Um, so I think that that is likely the future, but it's not something that we're that we're seriously considering today. But it's a great it's a great question. Representative Small. And if I may add, um, to go to a chromosomal level, we would have to everyone would have to participate in genetic testing, which would then have to signify what chromosomes you have. And, and there is a plethora of chromosomes beyond just XX and XY, um, recognizing intersex identities, which go beyond just those two uh, chromosomal designations, we could say. Thank you. And that's a, uh, I'm sorry, I, and I apologize by the way, Representative Small, that's a much better answer when, when I heard XX and XY. <laughs> I was thinking, Mr. I was thinking Mr. Andrew, of- we, we aim to please sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> And sometimes um, I, I was simply hearing that as 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 neutral markers. I, I would agree with you entirely about we don't want to be going by by chromosomes. And I was thinking about something entire, entirely in, entirely neutral, like you know mu and omega and you know epsilon. Okay, um, so let's review your second proposed amendment. The second proposal. This is um, the proposal that that. that um, the bill is proposed by the department el eliminated um, ex the, the language about confidentiality because it was our intention to put it into the, into the rule itself. Um, but given questions raised by the committee, the department offers this as a new subsection D, except it's otherwise required by law. And here we're talking about a like a court order. Change of birth certificates made under this chapter shall be confidential and shall be exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act. And this just makes it absolutely clear to, to any, any person without look, look, that they see the clear intention of the legislature is not that these protections be eliminated, but in fact, they're reinforced. Right. And uh, Representative McFawn, I'm going to um, call on you, even though your hand might not be raised, just because I know this was an issue that you raised when we were speaking about this earlier. Is, does this language, um, does this language uh, meet the questions that you had, address the questions that you had earlier in the week? Yeah, yeah, it does, except that, that, that when it was explained um, that the, the only way you could get uh, a copy of the birth certificate was by a court order. Did you say that, Ms. Anglin? That's the reference to except as otherwise provided by law. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, I I want to make sure that that because um, I had some trouble getting my birth certificate uh, years ago. Um, I want to make sure that the, the person can get it. I want to make sure that uh, a guardian or a parent can get it because there's, there's lots of reasons why they yeah. need to do that. Insurance purposes, all kinds of things. So um, this, this provision does not disturb the eligible parties the, as, as we discussed. That are already listed. Yes. Okay. Uh, my other question is, so if, this, let's say this amendment went through and we decided that X was the marker for non-binary. Um, that would mean we would have FMX as the markers. On the birth certificate, yes. Yeah, okay. Yep, that, that solves my problems. Okay, oh. thank you, Representative. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't mean problems, but it, Oh, oh, I see this issue. Okay. This issue. I'll just make okay, a quick let's note. Try not, let's try to get to the first Mr. Englander. You know. uh, okay. Uh, Representative Small. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Mr. Englander, can you illuminate for us the, the current process? So if I were to amend my birth certificate um, and say a public records was wanting to get a previous version of my birth certificate that was not amended, would the general public be able to access that today? No. 
and we no longer have amended and in previous iterations it, it had the designation amended on it and that would no longer be present on birth certificates that were amended correct that's correct there is no indicia of a, of, a, of an amendment wonderful thank you are there any other questions for mr englander yes Representative well, Rosenquist. maybe i haven't read it carefully enough, but wait if somebody had conversion surgery uh to change their marker, okay, would, would they have to provide proof that that surgery had been performed or not? So the the way the law stands today, and I and I again, I'm sorry if we if you covered this earlier. The the one of the complexities, uh, uh, the the thing that gave rise. I promise, Representative Rosen, because I'm going to answer your question. It's coming. It's just good. Um, so the answer, actually, let me answer your question. The answer is no. The, what gave rise to this proposal is persons who came to us and said, we would like to change our, our gender marker on birth certificate to X. And you can do that through rulemaking. And the concern of the department is, under current law, under five, 18 VSA 555112, a person has to go through a, uh, either um, medical, psychological, uh, they have to take steps whereby a doctor makes a find that that person has transitioned from male to female or female to male. By allowing somebody by checking a box to be gender X, you create an in, you would have created an inequity in the law that somebody who wanted to go from M to F would have to go through hoops of the kind you're describing, Representative Rosenquist, but somebody who uh, was go wanted to be non-binary wouldn't. So the reason this pro we proposed that we that the Department of Health through rulemaking create one simple equitable system that would rely on self-attestation and not a court order or the or the the, the writings of a of a physician. Thank you. Yeah, Representative mm -hmm. Bremstead. Thank you. So that just made me question just one quick question. Um, so if it's self attestation, attestation. <laughs> um, does that, so that means that if you are parents who have a child in the hospital and you're filling out the birth certificate, can you choose the non-binary for your child if you, if you would like to? So that's something that we've discussed with the advocates and internally, that's a question that will be answered during the rulemaking process. We've not come to a, I don't think there's a, there, there isn't a consensus yet about uh, about um, how we should proceed. So the answer is maybe. Okay, <laughs> to be determined. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, Representative Garifano. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, Mr. Inglander, can you um, talk a little bit about how this um, applies to minors? So under 18, yep. uh, Will there have will there have to be a parent permission to select the X marker, or can a minor choose their own marker? So it, that that also will be decided through the rulemaking process. The Department of Health is is open to to all so to be decided that we are open to all possibilities. I, I, I mean, I would I would say this. It certainly would not be, the, in my individual opinion, this is just us, right? In my personal opinion, the rest of the world. But, yeah. I, I imagine if there's any, if there's an age limitation, it would be fairly low. Making a teenager have to go to a parent to co-sign would not be something, would be inconsistent, frankly, with Vermont law in the way that we treat minors who are seeking other kinds of treatment and, 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 and opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Whit uh, Mr. Whitman, Representative Whitman. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And um, I apologize for bringing this question a little bit late in the process, but it came to me yesterday evening. It's kind of a bit of a bigger picture question around the bill. And I guess it's like assuming, you know, decades from now, if there were a um, less than ideal scenario where the political landscape of the Department of Health were to change and become less gender inclusive. Um, would this rulemaking authority allow them to reverse um, some of the changes that we might see are the stated intention of this bill, but is it um, within statute? Is, is that question directed towards me, Representative Whitman, or? 
I would say yes, um, just based on what is within the bill itself. And I suppose if uh, Representative Small wants to speak to this at all, I'd also welcome that. I, I would also say that I think that the, the First Amendment that Mr. Englander spoke of um, is clear about legislative intent and um, is a reason that we, in the thought process, moved that from rulemaking, which is more easily changed, shall we say, to legislation that identifies clear legislative intent. Would that be along the lines you were thinking, Mr. Englander? Yes, that is exactly it, Representative Wood. Okay. Does that help? I think it, it I think it does satisfy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Representative Small. Oh, I'll oh. let Mr. Englander go first. So I just, I, I'm not sure if everybody around the room is familiar with the rulemaking process and that the last stop or the penultimate stop on the rulemaking process is agencies must appear before a joint committee of senators and representatives. And their one of their two primary roles is to look at the legislation and to look at what's being proposed to assure compliance with that. They also reach out to the, 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 the chairs of the committees of jurisdiction and say, is this do, do you agree this is consistent with legislative intent? And, and LCAR takes that duty very, very seriously. Thank you. Representative Small. Oh, Mr. Englander took the words right out of my mouth. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank All you. All right. Are there any other questions for Mr. Englander? Thank you so much for being here today. And uh, thank you for these um, proposed amendments. Yes, Representative Rosenquist. I'm sorry, if he's leaving, I just wanted to- Well, I'm not sure he's leaving, but- oh, okay. uh, all right. Are you gonna be sticking around? And I can I'm... ask this one, all right? Yeah, yeah, and that's that absolutely is, sure. You know, this is a vital record, a birth certificate. That's basically what we're talking about here. I guess there are other documents included, but uh, I, I look at, you know, what is the purpose of the birth certificate? To begin with, when people take census figures, let's say uh, every 10 years we do a census, you know, so we're going to have, it would appear to me, we're going to have a disparity between uh, the scientific definition of what male and female are or other things versus uh, this document. In other words, understand what I'm saying, they're going to be um, and let's say there are distribution of benefits that are based on one of these uh, items, like women are getting a bigger benefit than men or something. You know, how are we going to determine that? The, the document that we've always gone to is a birth certificate that based is, is based on the, the scientific uh, information that uh, it's a male or a female or what have you understand what I'm saying and now we're going to these documents will not be able to provide that information. Mr. Englander you want to um, take a gander at that? Sure I, I would say that the I would say that the idea that there is a that there's a scientific determination of somebody's gender is itself somewhat complicated. When, when somebody's gender is assigned at birth, it is one person using their subjective judgment looking at, at one, one datum about a person. It is not, it is not their, their personhood. Um, uh, you know, uh, a plumbing isn't destiny. Uh, it, the, the, the birth certificate should represent who the person is in their, in their whole part to the extent that that is, that is useful to them and to the government. But the idea that there's gonna be a disparity, people make choices throughout their life. They find out who they are, they take different jobs. They have, I used to just be, you know, Englander and now I'm Englander Esquire, which is, you know, <laughs> what makes my parents very, very happy. So I think that, I, I think that, that al al allowing this better reflects who the person is and it and that person isn't confined to this one very small thing that you know there's a very high level um of uh, uh we know of uncertainty at a certain moment in their life thank you thank you thank you david um okay um, I think that we have wrapped up questions for you, at least right at this particular moment, Mr. Englander. Thank you so much for being here. And 
Uh, it would be great if you're able to stay on to listen to the other witnesses and in case there are questions as we move along. Thank Is you that so possible? Much. I'll, I'll be, absolutely, I'll be right here. Okay, thank you. Yes. I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Emily, Emily Russo, the Transgender Program Coordinator at the Pride Center of Vermont. Welcome. Welcome um, to our committee room. And um, if you could uh, say your name uh, for the record, and then we turn the floor over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, for the record, my name is Emily Russo. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I'm the transgender program coordinator for the Pride Center of Vermont. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm here in support of H628. Uh, I would like to start by relaying some data on discrimination faced by the trans and gender nonconforming community. This will just help give an idea of why it's so important to create equitable systems for trans and gender nonconforming folks in our communities. Um, according to a study done by the Williams Institute, the trans community experiences violence at four times the rate as their cisgender counterparts. Trans people and specifically trans women of color have increasingly been fatal, fatally victimized over the years. And 2020 was one of the deadliest years for trans and gender nonconforming people. Uh, in addition to crimes of victimization, the trans community also faces staggeringly high rates of attempted suicide. Research conducted by the American Academy of Pediatrics recorded alarming levels of attempted suicide among transgender youth finding the highest rates are among transgender boys and non-binary youth specifically. In a study published by the Williams Institute on suicide attempts among the transgender and gender non-conforming adults, 41% uh, of trans and gender non-conforming adults report a suicide attempt in their lifetime, which vastly exceeds the 4.6% of the overall US population. H628 would allow transgender and gender nonconforming folks to have their gender identity reflected across the identif uh, across identification documents. This will help mitigate discrimination that's experienced by trans and gender nonconforming folks attempting to change legal documents to affirm their identity. A lot of the assistance I provide in my role to the trans community is changing documents to reflect, reflect name and or gender markers. This process can be long and really frustrating, which can impact the mental well being of an individual. So, allowing trans and gender nonconforming individuals to amend their vital records to accurately reflect and affirm their identity through a simplified process will go a long way toward creating a more equitable system for the trans and gender nonconforming communities. Um, Working to remove as many barriers as possible for trans and gender nonconforming folks uh, to live authentically reduces harm to our community. Um, and I'm also in support of Mr. Englander's proposed amendments, which I have read over and we just discussed. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you have any questions for me. Well, you took one of the questions, Emily, right out of my mouth when I was just going to ask you about what you thought about the, the amendments proposed by the health department. Um, so thank you. Thank you for um, for answering that question. Um, open it up for questions from committee members. Uh, any questions that you might have for Emily? Uh, I have one, Madam Vice Chair. Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Representative McFawn. Um One of the things that I would like some kind of an explanation of so that people understand a bit better. Um, one of the statements that's made is by having this birth certificate uh, situation changed that um, it would, well, one of the reasons for doing the change is to uh, cut down on the discrimination and violence towards people. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? How is this birth certificate going to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the birth certificate. Yeah. Uh, so I think in many ways, having your legal documents reflect your gender identity uh, is a safety matter for a lot of folks. So being able to 
use your legal documents when you're changing anything where you need or when you're calling when you're needed to provide these documents if there's a discrepancy uh between one document and another document that could lead to your um being outed uh as trans or gender non-conforming and that can have repercussions of violence or harassment uh so i think having the ability to have your records uh, consistent and affirming of your gender identity is very important for safety in, in situations like that. Does that answer your question? Partly it does, yes. Yeah, it was a very good example of one. Thank you. Thank you, Representative McFawn. And uh, Representative um, Small. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, and thank you, Emily, for being here today. I will just acknowledge that, of course, we do share a workplace um, <laughs> outside of legislative times. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could illuminate for the committee what the, the main barriers are for folks who are trying to amend their birth certificate, um, the challenges that you see folks running into and in, in that you assist them with. Yes, absolutely. Um, so when I work with folks in the community who are changing their documents uh, to reflect a lot of times, um, especially so the DMV process is fairly straightforward in, in changing that that gender marker to X. Um, but as it stands right now, when folks go to change their um, birth certificate or passports or other documents, the process is a bit more challenging. Um, and based on what documents you need to, and I'm just pulling up my um, my little thing that I usually go to when I'm, I'm working with folks um, to see what exact, those exact documents are. Um, but when amending your birth certificate, you need, Sorry. Um, so right now, as it stands, uh, you need an application for the new birth certificate and a court order certifying your name change. Um, and then if there are some discrepancies and they don't match, it definitely makes the process harder. Uh, so I'm kind of losing my train of thought. Um, And I feel like I'm not answering your question very well, but yes. We can, we can check in again if you need to. That's good. That's good. It's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, all good. It's all good. W one of the things that I noticed when you were uh, testifying, Emily, is that you had some really important information that you were sharing. And I was just wondering if you would be willing to send that to our committee assistant, Julie Tucker, so that we can um, post it for the record. Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, and we are um, joined by our uh, chair now. So um, I just wanna check in with people, see if there are any other questions for Emily. And um, if not, we'll move on to the next witness. Oh, could I? Yes, uh, yeah. Representative Rosenquist. Just, uh, thank you very much, Emily. But uh, it would seem that one of the reasons for this, this change or this, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, working with the birth certificate and keep, uh, keeping it confidential, it would seem that it's sort of counterproductive to the fact that people might think that the birth certificate would lead to them being ostracized or, how should I say, it? why would they want something going? Uh, non-binary if they think that would cause retaliation. I guess that's what I'm asking. Um, Understand what yeah. we're saying we're going to keep this birth certificate uh, confidential because of the fact that somebody might be outed, I guess is what the term was, okay, uh, based on that. So why would you want it on your birth certificate at all then, you know? Uh, I guess that's where I'm a little confused as to where you're, you want an identity marker, but you're also concerned that the identity marker may, may cause retaliation. Okay. 
Yeah, I think um, visibility and representation is super important in um, identity, but it also should be self-disclosed. So uh, you should be able to, if you choose, um, disclose your gender identity um, and have that reflected in uh, your documents. So it would, it's more about validation of having your identity recognized on documents and, um, consistent across the board. And then, um, ho uh, hopefully, I mean, we get to a place where systems are non-discriminating against, uh, non-binary identities or gender non-conforming identities. Um, and, but I think it should be up to the individual to have this the ability and system in place that they can have their identity reflected on their on their documents. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Appreciate very much your testimony today and your answers to our questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you. And I, uh, I guess I want to say at the, <clears throat> at the outset, I'm um, I regret that I was not here at the beginning of your testimony, and I will review um, the YouTube link. Uh, the world of the legislature means sometimes you have to be in three places at once, and uh, this was one of those times. And so I do apologize. It does not reflect my interest in um, moving this bill forward. Um, our, our last witness that we um, have is Dana Kaplan. And um, Dana, I understand that um, you brought um, wow. some youth um, with you. And so um, I um, have they already introduced. No, I was just going to say. OK, <laughs> that was... um, um, so um, I want to, I guess, turn it over to you um, um, in terms of how you want to incorporate the um, youth in their testimony. And um, this is what happens when I come in late. Um, do they know who they're talking to? Yes, we've done okay. that. All right. <laughs> I followed your lead, Madam Chair. <laughs> and I'm Ann Pugh. <laughs> Great. Um, so for the record, can folks hear me okay? Yes. yes. So, so for the record, my name is Dana Kaplan. I use he and him pronouns, and I am the executive director of Outright Vermont. And it is true as a youth facing organization um, working in service to, to remove barriers that youth may be facing, um, it feels really, really important for us to make sure that youth have the opportunity to speak for themselves and their experiences. So I do have some remarks prepared. Um, I will share those, but I want to first turn it over to a couple of folks who are deeply involved in um, Outright's work and um, they are going to share testimony. So um, Charlie, you go ahead, you're going first. If you wanna just introduce yourself and then, um, and then Sawyer will speak and then Catherine will speak and then I will close us out. All right, um, hello. Uh, do I have to do like the for the record thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, for the record, I am Charlie McCaffrey, uh, and I, I I'm 16. I use they them pronouns and work with Outright Vermont as a youth organizer. Same now that they're on YouTube. Oh, good. Okay. Um, Charlie, you 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 went mute. Um, can't hear you. Now frozen. Oh, are we frozen? No. Oh, oh no. <laughs> You're back now. You're back now. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> Why don't we just start from the top and Charlie, if it makes you um, feel any better, this happens about once an hour. And <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, my transition has been one that has gifted me many experiences, both good and bad, that have shaped me into the person I am today. 
while it's far from over, this bill grants the ability for trans people to have like a more seamless experience when getting their gender, gender identity recognized legally in the state, uh, as you probably know. Um, a person's journey into discovering themselves. It's frozen again. Charlie, if you can hear us, um, I wouldn't, in my vast uh, knowledge of IT, I would suggest you turn the, um, um, your, your picture off and that sometimes helps. <clears throat> um, Dana, if you have I'm, a way- I'm gonna, Yeah, I do. I've just sent them a text. Um, I, I, I think um, maybe I'm they're going to, in. yeah, they're gonna come, they're gonna come back in. Um, and if, I guess let's just give it 30 seconds and, and um, we'll ask them to start again with their camera off and go from there. We do have all of the testimony written down. So um, if for some reason they can't get back on, uh, we can just submit it and or somebody can read it for them. Um, in the meantime, Sawyer, do you want to go? It looks yes, like Charlie is back on without their picture. Charlie? Okay, amazing. You unmute yourself. Hello, yes, I can. My, the computer that I was on died. <laughs> like it just oh, crapped oh, out right oh. there. <laughs> Wait, I'm so sorry. Um, would you want me to like start again or I should I wait why for why someone else to go? Start fresh. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Charlie, I guess. Um, my transition has gifted me with many experiences, both good and bad, that has shaped me into the person I am today. This bill grants, oh, while well, this is far from over, this bill grants the ability for trans people to have a more seamless experience when trying to get their gender identity recognized legally in the state. A person's journey into discovering themselves and their identity is an often a long road that we never really see the end of. And for the trans community, that is especially true. I realized I was 12 when I was around 12 years old, and it was a process that put my mind and body against one another. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't have the words or the language to begin explaining what I was feeling to the world around me. And when I found those words and came out, I spent the next few years trying hard to prove to the world and to my family that who I was was real. Um, and having to expose yourself that the part of yourself that is deeply personal to satisfy someone else's ideas of who you are is an exhausting process. And it's one that nearly cost me my life. And I know like I'm not alone in like dealing with stuff like that. And what I wanted to ask kind of is, um, so why are we like asking <laughs> trans people once again to bear themselves to the state and to be judged on, on if their experience and their person are worthy of being recognized and respected by the state. The difficulty of getting your information changed is putting countless trans people at the risk of being outed and exposed to violence, which is why for me and many of my trans peers, getting our information changed legally is like such a big milestone. This bill will allow trans people to get their information changed sooner and without harm so that we can rest assured that they're being accurately represented to places like their school, like work and doctors. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, at least, that this bill will save lives if it is passed and, uh, and put not only the current generation of trans people at ease, but also hopefully improve the quality of life of the trans community of the future, as we can hope to not lose as many bright minds as we do today because of the difficulties that they may face. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. That we're <coughs> glad that we were able to hear this, hear, hear your statements in um, as one and um, in their totality. Uh, if, if I might suggest um, have the three, uh, have the other two um, youth advocates speak and then um, if we have a few um, ending comments that would be wrap us up for today. Great. 
so Sawyer and then Catherine, and then I will end up. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sawyer Totten. Uh, I'm 18 years old. I am a transgender. I identify as a transgender male. I'm also a former legislative page. Um, and I have been through the experience of legally changing my name and gender, um, which in total cost my family about $200. Uh, it was $150 for the name change and $50 for the gender change through the court. And we had to pay that through the court. We only spent about $10 to get a cop certified copy of my um, birth certificate from the city clerk's office. Um, and to change my gender, I had to provide evidence to the court um, up from my doctors and to basically prove that I am transitioning, which shouldn't be the case. I mean, you shouldn't have to prove your transition. You shouldn't have to give evidence beyond your personal experience and your um, who you know you are to be able to change um, your gender on your birth certificate. And it's it, I think it is going to be a very important, um, if passed, it, it will be um, a very important thing for lots of trans youth as well um, to be able to change um, their gender um, without going through the courts, because on top of um, going through the court, you have to appear in front of the judge and um, the judge asks you a few questions before um, granting the name change, but you do have to appear in front of the judge and give over the evidence and just very clearly state why you're changing your um, gender, which can be very intimidating um, for some people to have to appear in front of a judge to be able to change their um, name and gender, and um, also being able to have an option besides male and female is very important um, because there, is so, there are so many people who do not fit into the binary of male and female, and being able to, on their birth certificate and on legal documents and on driver's license and everything, be able to identify as non-binary or not male and female is very important and very validating, and it it shouldn't be up to anyone but the person um, petitioning for a legal gender change to make the choice. And it should just be between the vital records and that person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sawyer. Catherine? Hi, my name is Catherine Thomas. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns, preferably they, them. I am 18 years old and I will be graduating from Twin Valley Middle High School this year. I work as a youth organizer at Outright Vermont. I'm eager to speak to you all about Bill H628. Passing this bill would change so many lives for the better. Transphobia is rampant globally and Vermont is no exception. Every day, transgender people risk their lives to express themselves. In 2019, Vermont had one of the highest rates of biased motivated incidents against the LGBT community in the country. This is unacceptable. I hear slurs thrown at my trans peers every single day, whether in the classroom or on the street. If these children could change their birth certificate to help ease the obstacles that they face, they may have a better chance at a normal school career. According to the 2019 YRBS survey data, LGBTQIA plus high school students were more than two times as likely to be threatened with a weapon on school property. These are young people. They deserve to be protected. And it is the responsibility of the legislature to protect them. If this bill is not passed, I have no doubt in my mind my peers will continue to be singled out and discriminated against due to their sex assigned at birth. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, do we have a few minutes for me to read my testimony? Okay. We certainly do. Um, yes. Do you do you want to pause and ask folks questions now, or do you want to for me to go and then I sort of open it I, up I to our crew? Mm -hmm. uh, pl please okay. go ahead. Okay. Great. Great. Um, so, as I said, my name is Dana Kaplan. I'm the executive director of Outright Vermont. Um, Outright is Vermont's LGBTQ youth organization, helping what's estimated to be about 14% of our state's youth 
find hope in a world that hasn't yet caught up with their lived realities and basic needs. And I, I say that hasn't yet caught up with um, specifically sort of in response to the question of if it's so dangerous to have a gender marker that is X, why would you want to do that? And I think that this is really about an opportunity to change systems and structures that are just outdated. Um, the majority of youth who we work with at Outright Vermont at this point use they, them pronouns and identify somewhere outside of a gender binary. This is just where we are in 2022. Um, as it's been stated, having a legal document that reflects your identity has far reaching impacts on every aspect of a young person's life. Proven social and medical benefits include, but are not limited to, fewer suicide attempts, ideation, and depressive symptoms. Make no mistake about it, having to navigate the incongruence of such basic and powerful documents can often be outright dangerous, adding fuel to already unconscionable levels of ignorance, bias, and discrimination that a person just trying to live their authentic life and happens not to be cisgender can face. Yes, even in Vermont, this is true. We're in a youth recently shared a story with me about how they were refused care at the emergency room when the doctor realized they were transgender. The research is clear. The risk youth face is outsized and the support needed to mitigate that risk must affirm and celebrate all of our beautiful and unique selves. We cannot stand by when 50% of these young people purposefully hurt themselves in the last month. In the past year, 36% made a suicide plan and one in five attempted suicide. Those are YRBS data points gathered, so this is Vermont, before the devastating and compounding impacts that overworked systems and widespread disconnection has created from this global pandemic. We can look back at history to see the ways that inclusive social policies, laws like marriage equality, have directly linked to decreases in youth suicide. Passing this pivotal legislation is not just the right thing to do, it's basic survival. Identity validation does save lives. Seeing ourselves accurately reflected on the very documents that literally prove our existence matter. Birth certificates are so common that many of us overlook their significance until we need to use them, wherein they're necessary to obtain a social security number, apply for a passport, enroll in school, get a driver's license, gain employment, or apply for other benefits. Desmond Tutu said it best, describing the birth certificate as a small paper that actually establishes who you are and gives access to the rights, privileges, and obligations of citizenship. Minority stress model helps us frame the disparities among marginalized communities, noting that poor health outcomes are caused not by being who you are, but as a result of the relentless struggle that comes from having to navigate the prejudice and harm embedded in these very systems and structures that we depend on. It is hard being a young person in the best of circumstances. And these days, well, we are a far cry from anything resembling ideal. I implore you to take very opportunity that you have as change makers with this bill and any others for that matter, that could in some way, large or small, rectify the very real lived impact of ignorance, hate, and harassment on a policy level. This is simply about giving some of our most targeted and vulnerable Vermonters the chance to live full lives, lives that start and depend on the most basic of legal documents to affirm our identities. The stakes are too high not to get this one right, the time to do so is now. In a recent study of Massachusetts and Rhode Island residents who happened to be trans, those who had access to legal gender marker and name change had lower negative emotional responses to gender-based mistreatment and improved mental health outcomes. For many trans and gender diverse folks, an important process of social gender affirmation is pursuing legal gender affirmation by updating one's legal name and or gender marker on identification documents. Possessing an accurate government ID is often necessary to access healthcare, housing, education, and employment. The resources 
from which trans people continue to be excluded and marginalized. We use this opportunity to create ease and access where we can in a world where so much is beyond our control. It's incumbent upon us to take action where we can. We must acknowledge that the current process for changing gender marker is confusing and somewhat convoluted, which is the last thing that young people need. We do appreciate that the Department of Health has indicated support for this change, and we do request that you include specificity regarding the protection of privacy in amending these documents. Happy to see that new language included. Uh, we must make the legislative intent clear that privacy protections are critical and non-negotiable. Uh, we have recognized the need for a third option on driver's license. We must follow suit with birth certificates, um, making the language clear and explicit to ensure that Department of Health shall, not may, adopt rules to add more options to gender markers. Many states have not yet modernized their policy or process, making it significantly challenging, but it's 2022 and we are Vermont, let's get out in front like the leaders we are. Rules that meet a minimum standard for the well-being of our most marginalized community members are the rules that we need. Increasing structural support for trans individuals, including enactment of state policies, ease legal gender affirmation, that ease legal gender affirmation is a move that we can make today. The bottom line is that we all want to live a life congruent with who we know ourselves to be. When you see windows and mirrors that reflect possibilities for your future self and current versions of who you are in the people around you, that is life-changing. I thank you for your clear, bold action to support policies and provisions that give the people most affected by systemic failures a chance to live. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and this has been a very full um, afternoon. Um, uh, Brenda, I see that you are raising your hand. I am, uh, I think if that was waving goodbye, um, we are um, going to be wrapping up and I believe you testified earlier. I did. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I was just uh, congratulating Dana on outstanding testimony and I want to support uh, I support them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we before we wrap up for uh, this afternoon, um, one I hope folks understand that this is we will not be taking a vote today. We are taking this bill up again next week, um, and I understand there were amendments and other things offered, so we will have more discussion on this. But before we close, I want to know um, from the committee. Um, besides my comment that. Um, uh, uh, Dana, your, while your testimony was wonderful, and I agree with Brenda and very thoughtful um, for myself, um, I'm going to, uh, I want to call out Charlie and Catherine and Sawyer, and um, uh, it is so important that we hear from youth and that youth become engaged in whatever the issue is, but in particular, this issue um, as it relates to who they, who they are and who they are becoming. And your voices are, um, have been very impactful and very important and very articulate. And uh, you could perhaps give some lessons to some other people on, <laughs> on how to testify. Um, but um, that's my comment. I wanna really find out from any, from the committee, if you have questions or you wanna say anything to the, um, the youth. The only thing that I would say is that if you are um, willing to submit your comments um, so that we are able to have them for the formal record when other people can refer back to them, as, as Chair Pugh said, um, they were very impactful and it'd be helpful to be able to, to look back at them if you are um, willing to submit them to our committee assistant. Um, and I will add, uh, thank you, Dana, for, for bringing in these uh, phenomenal youth and, and to all of you, it, it is such a vulnerable act to share your stories, mm -hmm. uh, to share your stories, not only with our committee, but knowing that this is going out live on, on YouTube. Um, 
I am so grateful for your representation and um, for your stories and and moving forward this this legislation. Uh, and of course, a, a shout out to Sawyer for your continued work in the legislature and coming back <laughs> after being a page. Um, we look forward to a future with you uh, in the in the state house once again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I think this ends um, the committee's testimony for today um, on the bill um, H628, and it will um, end our committee meeting. And I. Committee, I think we get a prize. I believe we're the last committee in the building. Uh, <laughs> um, and so please.